Lunch. After much schooling, a sound comes like a great bee buzzing. The bell means lunch, Mr. Franklin explains. He gives me a small piece of blue paper. This is for your food. Thank you very much, I say in my most polite English words, but I don't understand how the paper can help my noisy belly. You give the paper to the cooking people and they will give you food, Mr. Franklin explains. Tastes much better than paper, he laughs. Well, usually anyway. The eating room is grand with long tables and strange and wonderful smells and many students chattering. I stand in a line and soon kind white hatted people fill my plate high with food. Ahead of me, I see the snowball girl named Hannah from my building. She says, don't eat the mystery meat if you value your life. Then she points to a brown wet pile on my plate and makes a face that says bad taste. When my tray is heavy with the gifts of food, I stand still in the stream of students. I don't know where to go to enjoy my feast. Hannah waves. Follow me, she says. I'll tell you what's safe to eat. But it's all so fine, I say. She shakes her head. Kid, you got a lot to learn. Fries. We sit at one of the long tables. Nearby are two students from my class. Jamie, the boy from Guatemala, and Nishan, the girl from Ethiopia. Hey, Jamie says. Hey, I say back, but I can't talk anymore because my mouth is already full of new tastes. Excuse me, I say when I've swallowed at last, but what is this amazing food? I hold up a brown stick. Fry, Hannah says, one of the five major food groups. This fry? It grows in your America ground? I ask. Hannah laughs, a sound like bells on a windy day. I suppose you could say that. You're Keck, right? I know because I asked your cousin. Hannah passes me a paper cup filled with strange and beautiful red food. Ketchup, she says. You dip your fries in it. I do what she says, then eat. You're a fine cook, I say. Hannah and Jamie and Nishan laugh. I feel glad I found enough words to make people happy. When a friend laughs, it's always a good surprise. Not knowing. I see your cousin as, at the apartment sometimes, Hannah says. He's a very quiet guy. I have to think for a moment. To eat, eat such happy food and think about words at the same time is much work. Gunwar, I say has many worries. He seems kind of sad, Hannah says. I look at the fry in my hand with its shiny coat of red. I want only to eat and not to remember, but Hannah's words tug like a tight rope on a calf's neck. Gunwar lost his father and his sisters when the fighting came, I tell her. Hannah nods. Her eyes are blue and gray, or maybe green. I can't be sure. I remember a kind doctor at the camp with such eyes. How did he lose his hand? Hannah asks in a gentle voice. I don't know the words for this. Some English words I hope I never learn. <sighs> Men came with guns and knives to our village, I answer at last. Oh, to be in such fighting, says Nishan, is very bad. And what about your family? Jaime asks me. I stop eating. I take a breath. My father and my brother Lual, they were killed by the government men. I saw it. I pause as a memory pokes at me like a knife in my back. I was lucky to see, I add. Lucky? Hannah asks. Her voice says she doesn't understand. Nishan looks at me with eyes that know of such things. Maybe Keck means lucky to know for sure, she explains. Not knowing, it's the hardest. Yes, I agree. The hardest. How about your mom? Hannah asks softly. I... Guilt grabs my throat. I will not go to that black place today. I try again. She'll come, I say. 
I'll wait here for her. Oh, waiting is hard too, Hannah says, and I can see that she also knows sad places. I push my tray away. I'm not so hungry anymore. Home. I take the school bus home. It's a long yellow car filled with screaming and laughing students and many paper balls wet with spit. I don't think it would be easy to drive such a car. My aunt is sleeping when I get home. Gunoir enters with a white basket under his arm. The washing machine's in the basement, he says. The what? I ask. The room way down at the bottom of the stairs. I'll show you later. He surprises me with a smile like Luol might have made. A big brother making trouble smile. You'll like doing the wash. It's my job, but if you want, I might let you help. Sure, I say, although I don't trust that mischief smile. I remember well how Luol and Gunoir used to tease and test me. I always, always I was the little child with foolish ideas and silly ways, and always they were too old to bother with me, unless it was for their own fun. The door to my aunt's room opens and she comes out slowly, yawning and stretching. Oh, how was school? She asks. You would not believe it, I say. They teach you and feed you and I have my own desk. We're going to visit the zoo where animals live and the plan, uh, planet, uh, planetarium where, where stars live. And I'm going to learn how to dunk slam in the class called P.E. Slam dunk. Benoit corrects. Good, my aunt says. Good boy. And she fills a kettle with water to put on the cooking fire. I want to tell her more, but I can see that her mind is visiting other places. I think maybe I'll like living here in America, I say to Gunoir. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But you'll never really feel like an American, Gunoir says. You'll see. Why? I ask. Gunoir shrugs, because they won't let you. He tosses the basket on the sofa. I'm out of here, he says, switching to English. Be home by, my aunt begins, but Gunoir is already gone. Time. My aunt sighs and leans against the counter. He's just not happy here, she says. I know it's been hard for him, but he doesn't try. She rubs her eyes. I have to go to work, Keck. I've got an early shift. Eat what you'd like and go to bed by eight. I learned a clocks at the camp, I say. It is called time telling, but why not use the sun and the stars? My aunt points to the tiny clock strapped to her arm. Here in America, this is the sun. You'll get used to it. For now, just get some sleep. I watch her put on her heavy coat. She isn't even at work yet, and already she's tired. I go to the door with her. Are you... I stop and then try again. Are you glad that you're here? My aunt seems surprised that I would ask such a question. She thinks for a moment. Mm, the freedom is a, a great gift, she says, to choose your leaders, to walk the streets unafraid, but, but it's lonely here and, she hesitates, hard to change when you are older, to learn new words and new ways. That is big work. But for you and Gunoir, it'll be easier. Well, that's my hope anyway. I watch through the window as she tracks the path through the new snow falling. Her footprint, footprints catch the flakes, then vanish like pebbles in quicksand. Helping. When my aunt leaves the apartment, it grows hushed as the air before a storm. I turn on the TV machine, but the words are too fast coming. My aunt had looked so weary, I wonder how I can help. In the cooking fire room are many dirty dishes. Maybe I can clean them for my aunt. I've seen her wash some plates in the sink with bubbles. But now there are many dishes stacked high. Gunoir said the washing, the machine for washing was in the way down at the bottom of the stairs room. Maybe that's what his basket is for. Carefully, I place the cups and saucers and plates in the basket. 
With my special key, I lock the apartment door just as Dave warned me to do. Then I carry the basket of dishes down the stairs to the room of washing. It is good to be a helping person. If my father were here, he would be proud, I think. An ache in my chest comes throbbing like an old bruise. The way down room smells like a rainy day. I see six white boxes with doors. Some are making noise. I find a sleeping one and open the top. One by one, I put the dishes into the hole. Then I close the top and wait while all around me, the machines hum and talk. How not to wash dishes. Just then, Hannah appears in the doorway. She's carrying a basket of clothes and a big red bottle. Hey, she says, what's up? I look at the ceiling. No, that means what's new, what's going on? She laughs. You must feel like I do in Spanish class. The machine isn't working, I say. Well, did you put four quarters in? Hannah asks. She, she reaches into her pocket and pulls out shiny circles. Money, she explains. It makes the machines go. She laughs her good laugh. Actually, it makes the world go. Here, I'll lend you a buck. I can't, ex I can't accept such a gift, I begin. But she just waves her hand. You can pay me back later. She places the four money pieces into special holes in the machine, then pushes them. Noise begins like a tiny river flowing. It's working, I cry. Technology at its finest, she says. Of course, you still have to dry it all, then fold it. Fold it, I ask, but I don't understand. I'll show you. Let me sort these clothes real quick. Hey, you doing anything after this? We could go upstairs and catch some TV while we wait. That would be good, I say. I would like something to do. Good morning, my aunt aren't home. Yeah, my mom either. Well, she's not exactly my mom. She's my foster mom. She works the four to midnight shift at the quick stop. She pauses. That means she works at night, kind of like your aunt. I watch as Hannah pushes white clothes into another machine. These machines, they wash clothes and dishes? I say, shaking my head. Mama will be amazed when she sees this. Hannah looks up. Did you say? But just then the river sound stops and my machine begins to shake like a crazed dancer under a full moon. It's eating my dishes, I cry. Please make it stop. Hannah lifts the top of the machine. The horrible noise of its giant teeth stops. She peers inside. Whoa, she says. I think this is what they call a problem with translation. Not smart boy. I don't want to cry. A man must show strength in the presence of a woman. But if I had to choose between kissing a crocodile and telling my aunt the news of her broken dishes, I would choose the crocodile any day. I look into the hole. Hannah looks too. It is not a good thing to see. I have many more dishes, but they are much, much smaller. I look at Hannah, she looks at me. I, I cannot say why, but when I look at her, I feel like I've gulped down a laugh that needs to fly free. I laugh, and then she laughs. And then before I know it, we're on the hard floor laughing. Perhaps this is my punishment for trying to do the work of a woman, I say, wiping away a tear. Hannah punches my shoulder. Hey, in this country, a woman can do anything a man can do. She gets to her feet and she grins. This is your punishment for just being a moron. Uh, a moron is a not smart boy, I ask. She laughs. Yeah, you got it. I laugh too. I stand and pull out a piece of a plate. Maybe I can fix these. Well, I suppose we can glue some of the pieces together, put them in your basket, and we'll see what we can do. But don't get your hopes up. I'm used to hearing that, I say.